Hey, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. I hope you have a good one, whatever you're going to do. Uh, if you have a home, be grateful for it. If you have a dining room table to eat with a bunch of family, be grateful for it. And never take it for granted because, trust me, things can alter in the blink of an eye and you never think that you wouldn't have those things. Um, I'm not cooking any food for Thanksgiving this year. It's going to be very strange, but that's the way it goes sometimes. Now, today I'm going to be speaking about some current events, so I'm just going to get to it. You'll understand maybe if you see these things on the internet all over the place, what I'm about to talk about. But I want to start by the definition of the word stand. Because it's not just about standing in one place. To stand is to have an attitude towards a particular issue. To have a position taken in an argument that's extremely important and to have or maintain an upright position upright can mean that you're upholding righteousness as opposed to people in their wickedness and people who think that they're spiritually superior but technically they're not so i'm going to talk about Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10, where we were told to stand. And most people don't see that definition of stand as an attitude towards a particular issue, to take a position in an argument. So let's take a look at this scripture. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So he's telling us right there, to put on the whole armor of God against the devil so that we may stand in the evil day. So to be able to stand in the evil day, we need to have an attitude towards a particular issue and take a position in an argument to stand in the upright position and to defend the truth. Now, I'm saying these things because there are people that have billionaire status, millionaire status, billionaire status, and they will not show an interest in your testimony about Jesus because their own lives are messed up, their own lives are full of corruption and deceit and spiritual darkness, and I want to read how this is the case with all of these dissensions with, within all of these televangelist situations. And I want to read to you 2 Timothy 3. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, 
unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres, which is Janus and Jambres, withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, in Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, yea, and all that will live godly in Messiah Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Messiah Jesus, Yeshua. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus the Messiah, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Let's just think about this situation for a moment, because there are those who think that because of how long they've been a pastor and they like to flaunt it around, they've been a pastor for 40 years or something, so they think that everyone else is underneath them. They have a higher up opinion of themselves, and so they try to push their ideas and agenda on to others that sometimes is inaccurate. In fact, I've shown how some of the interpretations of some of the pastors has been way off. And, you know, all you have to do is look at my last video where I talked about the Antichrist and that he won't care what women want. It doesn't have anything to do with what we were told. There were those who were spiritually abusive to others and those that thought that they were above others in such a way that people should bow down to them and pay homage to them. It basically means to show them respect, to reverence them publicly. It means to show them honor and allegiance publicly. So this applies to something that's going on right now which I will be talking about in an indirect way in this video. Now, there were those in the past that demanded that others pay them homage and bow down to them, and they would be elevated, but the other person was supposed to bow down and agree to be subservient or show submission to them. In all of these cases, they were told to show submission, whether it be to a king or somebody that was in a position of power over them. They were supposed to be submissive. But in these cases, they did not show submission. They actually 
stood their ground. They took a stand where they had an attitude towards a particular issue. They kept a position that was taken in an argument against those trying to make them bow down to their way of thinking and their way of forcing them to do something beyond what their will was. So let's look at the situation where we had one man that was given a position of higher power and then others were supposed to bow to this person and supposed to submit to this person and how it didn't work out so well for them. The first episode of this that I want to mention is in Esther chapter 3. And it says, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. So we had this person put in a position of power above others. So we had this man, Haman, that was supposed to be bowed to and reverenced and thought that he had this high position that everyone should kowtow to what his viewpoints were. And if they didn't, the situation was the person would die. So it was very serious. And so it says, And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. So he was supposed to submit according to the king who put Haman in this position. So he was in a higher position, like a CEO of a company. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And it says, Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them. So Mordecai wasn't doing what he was supposed to do according to them. And they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. Sound familiar to something going on today? And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is, the month of Nisan, the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is, the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month that is the month Adar. And Haman said unto the king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, the silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seeth good to thee. And then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants, and to the governors that were over every province, and to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language in the name of King Ahasuerus, as it is written, and sealed with the king's ring. 
And the letters were sent by post to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people, that they should be ready against that day. And the posts went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city Shushan was perplexed. And when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. Now, the two witnesses are coming, and they're going to be dressed in sackcloth, just like Mordecai, in Jerusalem. And came before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate, clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids... And her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. And so the story goes on, but the bottom line is that there were some people in a superior position, and Mordecai was being told to submit to bowing and showing homage to Haman. But he refused to bow to this wicked man and the wicked things he was doing. In essence, Mordecai took a stand and did that which was right for the Jewish people. He took an upright position and stood in the day of evil. And he stood for what was right even though those around him were criticizing him and trying to cut him down to size and say that he needed to bow and scrape to this man. So what I'm trying to show here is that there are people today who have a high-ranking ministry and they're trying to get other people to show them homage. So there's people in church situations that try to get others to submit to them in a, a nauseating repetitiveness of submit, submit to my authority. I'm the big wig. And here's another situation in Daniel chapter 3. Now, this is another situation where somebody was supposed to bow down and pay homage to the king. So, here we are, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof was six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, and counselors, and the sheriffs, and all of the rulers of the provinces, to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Then the princes and governors and captains, the judges, treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all of the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at the what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So in other words, they were demanding that day that, you have to submit to this 
and you have to submit now. And if you won't submit, then you're out of here. You're in trouble, and you're going to die. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And by the way, sackbut, I believe that's the uh, bagpipes like Scottish bagpipes. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the flute, harp, bagpipes, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he shall be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. And it says Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, this is um, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And these were princes of Judah like Daniel. They were royalty. So they were the royalty of Judah. And they were given these Babylonian names. And he said, These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not the gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael, and then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? In other words, I have something that I want you to accept, and I want you to bow down to it and pay homage to it. And... You can't go against this, or you are surely going to die, and you're out of here. Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, bagpipes, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not... Ye shall be cast the same hour in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Because see, like he's the all-powerful one. He's the one in the high position. And he's demanding that these people do what he says. Because he has all power and authority as the all-powerful one over these princes. And they would not do what he said because they stood in righteousness against something that they saw that was evil, something that they, you know, were warning each other about, that they would not bow down to this. And Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our king, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. So even though they were supposed to submit to this authority, submit, 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 and do it now or else, um, they refused to submit. They stood their ground. They did what was right according to the Lord's word. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And in this day and age, uh, someone demanding that their son 
kind of pay homage to a new husband in demanding it, and they refuse. Um, God's going to stand for those who are in the right in the situation. And it says, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. So they paid a price for standing their ground to stand in the evil day and to stand against people that are living in sin and lust <laughs> in the evil day. And then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three bound men into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael, <laughs> ye servants of the Most High God, come forth, come hither. And then Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes and governors and captains of the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their heads singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. And then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed he, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, and that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael, shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. And then the king promoted them, in the province of Babylon. So there you have, once again, people. We had Nebuchadnezzar, who was in power for many, many years, and thought that he could talk down to those that were beneath him. But these men stood for what was right, even though they were being told to do something by an authority figure that was involved in evil. Now, another example is Judges chapter 2. I'll start in verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them that they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet, they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them, and they turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. 
And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They cease not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not Henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So the bottom line is you're not to bow down to certain authority figures and submit to them if what they are doing in their situation is evil and against God it's right for you to take a stand it's right for you even though somebody may be a pastor for 40 years and they're using that against you like they have all this authority that you must submit if they turn against God and they're doing something or they're connected to some evil, then it's right for the godly man and woman to take a stand, to have an attitude towards a particular issue and to take a position in an argument for righteousness sake and to stand against the wiles of the devil and Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Now, here's the situation. If somebody lost a parent, um, I can vouch for this greatly because my best friend and mother passed away, as you know. And it changed everything for me, including having a home. Um, and it was so radically... I mean, I was so radically grief-stricken by it that I needed time to grieve, and there wasn't time to grieve. I had to move and get my things out of our home because that's where I lived with Mom. Um, so if you're not giving your adult children time to grieve for the death of their father, and you don't even take into consideration that they are in grief, and then you're immediately getting married and trying to replace that person with another person and demanding that they toot the horn of that person or demanding that they read statements of, um, you know, acknowledging that person. It's kind of like being forced to bow down to Haman and to pay homage to him and, of course, that means to show them special honor and respect publicly and to formally and publicly show them allegiance. And you go against that, and then you're in danger, just like these people that stood their ground in the evil day and went against danger. They were threatened with death. They were threatened with anything in their life that these people could control. And so my whole point is that it's not wrong to take a stand in the evil day because the devil is at work. And those that take a stand for God, they want to pray about a subject before they make decisions and are not allowed to because people are demanding now you have to give us an answer. And it's just like these stories that if they didn't bow down and pay homage, public respect and special honor to a certain person, then they were threatened and their jobs were taken away and 
division came because of one person that came into the picture. Um, I can't say any more than that. I'm just showing stories in the Bible where it says to stand against the devil by putting on the full armor of God and to take a stand in the evil day when you are up against a brick wall. Don't be afraid to stand for what is right and true. So this is my message for tonight. I hope that you have a blessed holiday tomorrow. I don't know if I'll be able to come on here and say anything or not, but I want to hope that you have a happy Thanksgiving. My Thanksgivings are no longer Thanksgivings. Um, I thank the Lord for what I do have. I thank God for my mom and my grandparents and that are no longer here. And um, I thank God for every Thanksgiving I had cooking with my mom and making a beautiful turkey dinner and dressing and gravy and cranberries. And my mom was the very best cook. And I'm going to miss her greatly from now on. And um, every single year when this holiday season comes around now, I just want to go be with the Lord. And uh, it's polar opposite of what it used to be like. I'm thankful for what God has given me. I'm thankful that one day we will go to be with the Lord and be free from all of our burdens and every hateful thing that other men and women do and say to us. And may God be a shield about all of those who are struggling and suffering that stood up for what is right. God bless you and um, take a stand for what's right, even if someone is a king, even if someone is very powerful and you're supposed to submit to their authority. They didn't do it. And God was on their side because they didn't do what they were commanded to do. Let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> All right, well, I'll see you in the next video, and I'll talk to you later. Good night. Happy Thanksgiving.